my instincts of being a father kicked in. I need to fix this. I gotta fix this. How do I fix this? Where's my son? What do we have to do? I, I gotta fix this. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Like, what do, what do I do? I have two parents that are grieving because they lost their son, but like, hot dang, I just lost my best friend. Like, how, how is this? What's, what, what? Your mind just starts going a million miles a minute. And the mom radar knew that life was forever going to be different. Hey, I'm Eugene Cuevas. Welcome to a brand new series from Crosswinds Foundation and Front Porch Media. You may be familiar with our previous documentaries and our ongoing Warrior Hope program. But in this new chapter, we begin to discuss the warrior family. See, when a veteran deploys, we know that they face innumerable challenges, both on the battlefield and many times when they come home but so do their families while their veteran is away and many times when they come home. But in this first video, we meet the Zanowicks, a family whose veteran unfortunately did not make it home from the battlefield. How does a family ever respond to devastating loss? Is there really any hope for healing? We explore those questions and more in this chapter. So listen to their story. And stay tuned at the end for another message about how you can help warrior families like the Xanowicks. We, we were always a patriotic family. We always celebrated all the, uh, the you know, Memorial Day and, and for its proper purpose. And they was in Scouts and we always talked about those things and tried to teach that. Um, but the, the main impetus for him to go into the military though was um, because of 9-11. He determined that he wanted to, to serve the country, but um, after he got out of high school, he was really sort of, you know, at that, at that age, 18 years old, he, what am I gonna do with my life? Which path, which is the right path to take? And I said, Rocky, I says, why don't you just go to Ohio State University and, and you, you know, you can go to ROTC, you'll get out as an officer, and then you can serve, and then you can serve in the Marines. And he said, he looked at me. He says, Dad, he says, I want to be, I want to be a leader that's been where my men are going, where I'm leading my men. I want to have been there. I want, I want to have had that experience and be able to, to be a better leader. And he says, I, I think this is the would be the best thing for me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how can I argue with that? I mean. Really, my brother was good at giving me advice. Um, I mean, he acted like the older brother, so sometimes it was like, it's all right, I've, I've got this. Um, you know, everything will be okay, and you just need to take care of mom and dad. The thing I remember most about um, when he was committing to the Marines was the day he left. And the mom radar knew that life was forever going to be different. And yeah, I cried. I prayed as he was driving away with the Marine officer. I was in his bedroom by his bed kneeling and praying for him. I think somewhere, somehow, I knew how it was getting had. That was a start to a new chapter in our life, a new uh, journey, if you will, when he joined. Um, but I was proud of him, and I always will be. Was I proud of his decision? Yeah. Do I wish that he could have chosen something different? Yeah. But he did what he wanted to do. And he did make a difference. Totally. When they're deployed, 
you're deployed with them. You're just not physically there. Your whole being, your whole heart, mind, prayers are with them. And um, life here is just a, a distraction. And I would say, I would go on to say that, you know, and even for, for us, I mean, you, you, and for anybody who has somebody deployed, you actually have the gamut of emotions and you actually have um, all the thoughts that go through your head uh, and all the scenarios. And, and, and obviously there, there's the worst case scenario that is there in your head. And uh, there was a firefight with one of the companies and one of the, one of the Marines got hit and they needed somebody to get in there and get him and get him out to the helicopter to get him medevaced out. And so they picked Rocky because he was always training as guys. He had really good sense about orientation and maneuverability of the vehicles and stuff. And, and the, the, the officers knew that. So they picked him to take his fire team out to go get this Marine. When I got wounded in 2011 on June 3rd, um, our last day of the operation, uh, we went out early in the morning and we got in a small little firefight, um, probably lasted maybe 10 minutes, um, but things got pretty chaotic and somebody left a, a piece of equipment where we were when we had the firefight. Um, when we went back out there, we got ambushed and we think there was multiple firing positions just because of how uh, the rounds were impacting around us and we were near a couple of small compounds and I had my machine gun squad up on a small little hill and I was kind of directing fire for them and I was next to uh, the squad leader that I was attached to and talking to him and then as soon as I turned around I knew him so as soon as I turned around and I started to stand up uh, a round ricocheted off the wall right in the back of my shoulder and uh, I immediately knew I was hit. I felt pressure. I felt like someone swung a baseball bat to the back of my shoulder. And at the time, uh, I could feel my chest tightening up, and I was I was a little freaked out. Um, I thought it was a lot worse, and thankfully it was. We waited for a uh, vehicle to come get me, and uh, one of the guys in the vehicle, his name was Corporal Zanowick. And he was the one of the guys that helped get me safe, get me to safety. One of the trucks needed to move and got stuck. He says, well, we got to get this truck out and get it moved. So uh, we got to hook a chain up and pull it out, get it set up. And rather than have anybody do it and get out and, move, and put that chain out, he, he told them to sit tight and he went out and got out to do it. And when he got out and got the chain to hook up on the truck, and look up at the one, uh, the, the other, his second in command, um, he was shot by a sniper. Friday, June 3rd, um, I was at work. And, you know, when you're at work, you can't be on your cell phone. And my cell phone kept ringing. And it was the first time it went off, I noticed that, because you can glance and see the phone number. And I thought, well, I don't know that number. So this went on. All afternoon, my phone kept going off, and I kept ignoring it. One of my coworkers, I, I work in a call center. One of my coworkers came over and she said, I want you to come to the lobby with me. And all of a sudden, I, I became like a belligerent little two-year-old, and I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to the lobby. Because I knew what was there, I didn't want anything to do with. And Kimmy says, no, come on in, let's go. And she had to take off my headset for me, put it on my desk. She had to take me by my hand and drag me to the lobby, practically. And um, when you look up and see two Marines in dress blues and an Air Force chaplain standing there. You know it ain't good. I dropped to the ground. 
And then they came up to me, gave me a chair, and picked up my glasses. And the casualty officer read off that little piece of paper, the paragraph that explained that my son was dead. There's nothing like that. Nothing like that pain. Just as an aside, I've lost three sisters. I lost my mom, my dad, my grandparents. All those together don't equal this. Then I had to go home. Nicole was at school. Paul was at a Boy Scout camp. I finally found the address of the camp he was at. And, and about the time I found that, Nicole pulled up out back. I didn't even make it up the steps when the Marine Corps, uh, our two casualty assistant officers, in the walked out, out the door. And um, you have that realization of like, you want your brother to surprise you. You know, like they have like at the Dayton Dragons game where like sometimes the mascot will be the, you know, sibling or the dad or the son and they're hiding and they come out as a surprise. I was thinking when they walked out one split second, oh my gosh, he came home. Why, wait, why is he here? You know, and then the whole realization of, oh wow, this isn't good. He's either injured or he's killed. And as a mom, you want to run and hug your baby girl and tell her what happened. And they, they told me I couldn't. They had to go tell her. And I know they have their protocol. So I had to stand up on the deck. But they gave her the news and it devastated her. And then when they were done reading off their paragraph to her, she came up and I didn't want to let her go. And um, then we had to drive out to camp. So I'm at a camp, I'm at a Boy Scout camp. I'm, I'm doing a adult leader training, training other adults on how to do high adventure. And I look up and I'm, I'm in this big room and, and there's a glass windows. It's at a visitor center at a, at a local state park. And I see my wife and I think, how awesome my wife is coming out uh, and got off work maybe a little early to come out to, uh, to join us because she's also a scout leader. I thought, awesome. And I see her and she's not smiling. And then I see two people beside her and I see the Marines and I see the uniform. I threw everything I had in my hands through. And I mean, they don't have to tell you anything. They don't have to tell you. And I didn't really want to hear. I mean, I knew. And all I can say is that the cocktail of emotions that run through your body, that course through your veins are incredible. My instincts of being a father kicked in. I need to fix this. I got to fix this. How do I fix this? And I, I didn't want to hear, and I don't even recall hearing whatever it was he read. Didn't hear it. Didn't care. Where's my son? What do we have to do? I, I got to fix this. I, and, and at that point in time, I had, a, I had an unbelievably strong urge to have to see my son. We, the three of us, Paul and I and our daughter, Nicole, we couldn't do anything 
couldn't make a decision what, what to have for dinner. 45 minute conversation, including tears, because we couldn't make up our minds. And it was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, like what do, what do I do? I have two parents that are grieving because they lost their son, but like, hot dang, I just lost my best friend. Like how, how is this, what's, what, what, your mind just starts going a million miles a minute. What's gonna happen? What are we gonna do? Where are we gonna go? Can't make decisions, can't do anything. And, and we were just impossible, just the three of us were just impossible. People grieve differently. Mm -hmm. I expected everybody to be a certain way at a certain time, and I, I'm feeling this way right now, so you should feel that way right now. It's just not the case. And we had to learn to respect each other's mm -hmm. place, and being understanding of that process is huge. Mm -hmm. The grief book that they gave us in that grief book, which I was searching for answers, right? How do, how do siblings do this? Two pages. Well, that doesn't help me. Two pages on siblings' grief. Two pages. The rest is all on the parents, the spouse, and the child. But two pages for a person that is the closest in DNA you'll ever get to. A sibling. For a sibling. They grew up together. They knew everything about each other. The ins, the outs, the ups, the downs, the goods, the bads. Um, they're bonded like no other in this world. One of the things I come to understand is that when folks come up, they, they see us, the, the parents of the child, and they come up and they want to talk to us and, and give condolences and, and, and connect with us and not realize that standing next to us is our daughter who actually was the closest to our son of anyone during his lifetime. And it's, it's difficult to watch them suffer. So when my unit got back, I believe it was in October, um, we had a big old memorial service for uh, the individuals we lost. And, and, and after um, the memorial service, um, the next morning they had the Purple Heart service. So I was given my Purple Heart that day and at the end of the ceremony, and I sprinted it up to, to Paul and Annette Zanowick. And so all these Marines get up and they go that way. Oh, you know, they left the parade field and they're going back to the wherever. And so here's this flood of Marines. And then all of a sudden one of the Marines comes back and he is running back to me. And um, he came up to me and stood beside me I couldn't hear what he said because I had already read his name on his shirt and it was Erlinson. And I knew who Erlinson was. He was the young man Rocky's unit saved the morning of June 3rd. And so he's talking to me and he placed his purple heart in my hand and closed my hand around it and then went running back across the parade field. And um, what a gift. I know that meant the world to them, and we've, we've grown to have a big bond uh, since then. My recommendation would be connect with groups of people that have suffered the same 
loss, mm -hmm. um, those people have gone before you and know and they can guide you and they can help you and they understand what you're going through or get over the feeling that you're alone in this because you're not. It's really, really easy to become, uh, to internalize and withdraw from everything. It's really, really easy. And there's many, many days that we feel that way. But if you can just take little steps forward and, and push through, all I have to do is get from this minute to the next, from this second to the next. That's all I have to do. And that's all I try to do. Unless you've been and lost somebody, you'll never understand that until you've been there. And that's why I always say, like, if my if somebody asks, you know, or if they say that they've lost their child, I said, I'm here to help you, but I don't know how you feel. I can tell you from my perspective on loss. Talk with your family openly and communicate. Um, we've known families where this is the end of the family, the family fractures. If you're a family that's suffering loss, a, a tragic loss of a, of a family member, don't try to think that you can, you're going to be okay and you can do this on your own. Um, my recommendation would be to, to reach out to get some help, uh, whether it's a clergy or if there's counseling in, involved like there was with us with VA, seek it out and get it. Talk to someone, get your emotions out. For me, it became understood that talking about it was better than not talking about it. As hard as it was to talk about it, I would still cry. Probably always will. Even in the face of incredible loss, there is hope for healing. What really strikes me about the Xanawicks is the way that they have clung to one another through this tragedy and now are an inspiration for others. If you or a family close to you has suffered this kind of loss, consider what we learned from the Xanawicks. Seek counseling, talk to others who have walked this road before you, and look for ways to honor your loved one. Even though the wounds remain, there is hope for healing. If you'd like to learn more about how Crosswinds is helping families like the Xanawicks, visit us at warriorsonmission.org. And if you have found this content meaningful, consider a charitable donation to Crosswinds. Thank you. Go your own way. Go. So